Perry, uh, as Dennis says, it's like turning a great big battleship. But there have been a few significant milestones along the way. In 2016, um, Dennis helped to organise this meeting of the Royal Society, looking at these issues. Just describe that. You were present for that. Um, what was most significant about this particular meeting being held at the, the Royal Society? I went to that meeting and uh, before the meeting even started, you could tell that there was a very high level of energy in the atmosphere. There was a very high expectation that something really important is going to happen. And, um, and as soon as it started, I started hearing things that you would never hear on a large mainstream science stage a lot of criticism of the old neo-Darwinian paradigm and the selfish gene viewpoint and and the need for a viewpoint that cells are purposeful, tissues are purposeful, life is purposeful, that organisms engineer their own evolution. And there were only two old school neo-Darwinists there and they would they gave presentations and they would sometimes uh, come up in panel discussions and in questions. And I had never seen that group of people backpedaling, mumbling excuses and trying to sing face um, the way that they were. I had always seen them being the bullies, having the upper hand and neither the audience nor the other speakers were having it. It, it was, I mean, it was just a complete 180 from, uh, from the usual stuff. And, um, and the people there, they were not, you know, bizarre fringe, uh, people. They were some of the most respected scientists in the world, but from a evolutionary perspective, biology point of view most of these people had been sidelined and not listened to and after that meeting the tone in evolutionary biology shifted a lot and the usual bullies just went silent um people could hardly get uh folks like jerry Coyne or daniel dennett or richard dawkins to even comment on it um, and uh, Dennis can tell more, but my understanding is that uh, one of the reasons Dawkins debated Dennis was because there was peer pressure inside of Oxford, like uh, Richard, if you are a real scientist and you really care to defend your views, you really ought to take on your opposition. And, and so th the tone of evolutionary biology changed a great deal after that meeting. And um, it, it became much easier to have conversations about purpose, teleology, teleotomy, all, all those kind of words that uh, technical uh, people use to describe such things. And, and I think the last, so now we're seven or eight years later, we're in a whole different ball game than we were before. Hi, Justin here. Hope you're enjoying the conversation. Just to say, if you'd like a free chapter of my book, The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, I'll send it to you when you join my newsletter. Just visit justinbriley.com. The link is with the info below. Now, back to the conversation. I'd love to, to talk about this whole idea of purpose, agency, teleology in, in biology. Just before we get to it, Dennis, just, just briefly describe for me this recent tour in Korea that you did, South Korea, um, because that sounds like, again, a, a, an example of the way in which this whole area has changed completely uh, in, in terms of people's reception of, of these ideas. Yes, it illustrated it um, in tons of people listening in. I thought this was going to be a fairly modest conversation with maybe 40 or 50 people. Um, and the theme was human values in the 21st century. This was a group largely of Confucian scholars, uh, but with great influence in the media because some of these were broadcasters themselves. 
uh, and they were organizing a meeting asking the question, given what has happened in biology now, can one of the most important leaders of this switch in position explain to us the significance of that for human values in the 21st century? I had an audience of 12,000. 4,000 were in the convention center itself. Wow. I didn't even know it was going to be in a huge convention center. Uh, but I was shepherded up into this huge convention center, caught a glimpse of the amphitheater where the main presentation would have to occur, and realized there were thousands there. That was the first point which I realized I'd have to up my game. Well, I have the skill to do that, fortunately. I gave one of the best talks I can ever remember. Now, what I think did that was that the same organization, uh, the Confucianist scholars, but let me also emphasize they're broadcasters. They, they're television friendly. They know how to handle all of this. They put the debate with Richard Dawkins onto primetime television, subtitled in Korean. The subsequent YouTube Gosh. version of that has now been seen by about 0.7 million people. This is a country that has gone totally switched from gene centrism to the opposite view. Life has purpose. It's extraordinary. But I tell you, I can see the signs of that happening here in the UK too. There, there's still small signs at the moment, but I think the writing is on the wall, if I can put it that way. And 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 this is the fascinating thing, is, is that you're, it, it's the rebirth, if you like, of the idea of purpose, agency in biology, in life. Um, this has been very unfashionable in, you know, well, really, arguably since since Darwin. Um, it's, it, and, and it was really sort of, has been at the, the, the core assumption, really, of biologists and evolutionists for the last um century or so the so so do you i mean perhaps starting with you perry you, you could describe sort of what's switched and why it's now acceptable to talk in these terms about agency purpose and you know that very loaded term design even possibly when it comes to the way organisms uh, adapt and evolve and and so on in biology for the last 50 to 100 years, it's been very much frowned upon to speak of living things as being intrinsically purposeful or having desires or, uh, or having, you know, any level of design. Um, uh, it's, it's been taboo and it fits very nice. A purposeless narrative fits very nicely with a standard 20th century atheist narrative that says life is a happy chemical accident, some RNA somehow turned into a cell, and then all that had to do was natural selection and evolution, Darwinian evolution takes over, and here we are, and there's really nothing else to explain. Um, well, that doesn't work very well when you try to really explain, you know, why a lung cell reformulates itself and goes and wants to repair a nerve cell, uh, no, that narrative doesn't explain that at all. It, when you get down to how evolution really works, it doesn't explain any of that either. And so it has a very stifling effect on research. And even though some people who embrace a nihilistic story might like that story, most people find it to be very empty, meaningless, nihilistic. I um, mean, Dennis can speak for himself. I think this is one of the things that really irks him about this narrative is it dehumanizes us and it fails to explain why we shouldn't just exploit the planet and treat every single thing like a resource that should be maximized for our own good. Um, it, it's a very impoverished narrative. And 
you know, I think there there are reasons why all religious narratives tell you what kind of person you should choose to be. All of the religious traditions treat people as though we legitimately have choices to make, and the choice is not just some kind of an illusion. And I feel like biology is finally just catching up to this. Um, it's a little late, but better late than never. <laughs>